Our special guest today has been State Secretary of the ALP since September 2009. In taking up the post, he also became Labor's campaign director for the November 27 election. The mastermind behind the bid for a historic but ultimately unsuccessful fourth term. Nick Rees has impressive political credentials. He was John Brumby's head of policy and strategy and director of economic policy for former Premier Steve Brax. Since joining the ALP eight years ago, he's worked on many local, state and federal election campaigns. He has a background in law, finance and the media, having previously worked as a solicitor and a journalist. But it was one paragraph in his profile on the official ALP website that particularly grabbed my attention. It says, and I quote, with a young family, two daughters aged under three, a working wife and a substantial mortgage, Nick understands the pressures on working families and the importance of the vital services that government provides. One wonders how many others did too in the light of subsequent events. Did Labor, as one senior Liberal strategist suggested on election night, miss the main theme of the election, the cost of living? As The Australian reported a week later, the suburbs rose against Labor, punishing it for road congestion, poor public transport services, wasteful spending on a desalination plant, and rising energy costs. Was the focus on John Brumby a fatal mistake? Writing in The Age, former senior campaign officer, George Drutzis, who's with us today, said the public regarded him as arrogant, dismissive, and a poor listener who refused to hear genuine community concerns. Harsh words, which I'm sure our guest will respond to in just a moment. Indeed, in the midst of the soul-searching, after a last-minute swing to the Liberals installed a Bailiw government, Nick Rees has accepted a significant share of the responsibility for Labor's defeat. He told ABC TV's State Line, I was State Secretary and Campaign Director, and so you know the weight of the loss rests heavily on my shoulders. Today he's here to tell us what he really thinks went wrong and perhaps what, with the wisdom of hindsight, he should or would have done differently. Elsewhere though, the bloodletting has already begun. Scathing critiques are emerging of the defeated government in defiance of a plea by the new opposition leader, Daniel Andrews, to keep criticisms of the Brunery campaign in-house. Indeed, as Paul Austin reports, in the age today, senior federal Labor MP Kelvin Thompson maintains it became too cosy with the big end of town and lost touch with the real life concerns of ordinary people. He said Labor sided with business in backing excessive population growth and that, he argues, was the reason for the rising cost of living, transport problems, planning debacles and increased crime rates. So, with two reviews of the election loss now underway, how does Labor rebuild after its shock loss? The man with the answers to those questions and many more is our special guest. He's the man still very much in the hot seat. Would you please make welcome Mr Nick Rees. Friends, uh, members of the press gallery, uh, Felicity, Mum and Dad, thank you all for coming today. And my thanks also to uh, Michael and the Press Club for the invitation to join you. Uh, I'm here to contribute to our understanding of the recent, federal, uh, recent Victorian election. And if it is true that you learn more from defeat than victory, then my address today will surely be informative. I hope I do not disappoint. 
I'd like to take, provide an insider's overview of the campaign and my own post-campaign analysis. I want to reflect honestly on what went right and what went wrong for Labor, mm -hmm. as well as for the Coalition. Typically when Labor loses an election, commentators, the Conservatives, and even some from our own side line up to preach the doom and demise of the Labor Party. There will be many who will say we've lost our base, we've split our base, we've been preoccupied with issue X when we should have been focusing on issue Y. We're not defending our legacy. Our legacy stinks. Our campaign was too positive, our campaign was too negative. You get the picture. While there is certainly some truth to these critiques, my speech today will centre on what I believe are some immutable facts. But before I turn to these things, let me just remind people of the result on November the 27th. With a statewide swing of just over 6%, the Liberal National Coalition won 13 seats, 12 from Labor and one from Independent MP Craig Ingram. In the upper house, Labor lost three seats while the Liberals picked up three. These results, of course, do not reveal the significant variations that existed between the seats and between regions. Firstly, the Frankston and Lilydale railway lines were not happy hunting ground for the Labor Party. On the Frankston line, we lost five seats. On the Lilydale line, if you count Mount Waverley to the south, we lost four. This accounts for nine of the 12 seats that Labor lost. From the 1970s to the 1990s, they used to talk about Melbourne's clay belt and sand belt, deciding the outcomes of elections with the Maroondah Highway and the Nepean Highway running through each. In the 2010 election, it was, the highway was replaced by the railway line, but the seats remain largely the same. Despite this, there were seats, however, that Labor did very well to hold. Labor's polling during the campaign had us behind in Ripon, Bendigo East and Warren North, and some strong local campaigns there uh, allowed us to prevail and hold those seats. Labor also managed to stay on top in the outer eastern suburban seats like Yanyin and Eltham, and in the northeast, Mombolk, and in the outer east, uh, seats like uh, Narry Warren, uh, sorry, and in the southeast, Narry Warren South, and, uh, and so on. The fact that these swings were contained in these areas suggests that Labor's vote held up amongst young working families in these growth areas. And this is a critical thing for Labor going forward. With the exception of Seymour and South Barwon, uh, Labor also remained strong in, in uh, Ripon and the regional centres of Geelong, Ballarat and Bendigo. Finally, in an election with a solid swing against Labor across the state, the inner city seats held up well. The success in the inner city was about much more than just the decision of the Liberals on preferences. The significant shift in Labor's campaign strategy in the inner city was vindicated. Hundreds of volunteers were mobilised in these areas and the campaigns achieved a very high level of energy and this bodes well for the future. The winning a fourth term was always going to be the electoral equivalent of climbing Mount Everest. The Brax and Brumby governments had not already enjoyed Labor's longest period in office in Victoria for Labor. Labor had never won a fourth term in the 110 years that it had been out campaigning. Our polling told us that a very significant swing was always on the cards and that the election was going to be a very close run thing. And yet the mismatch between public expectations and what was actually going on out in the electorate was huge. Our final research track two days before the election showed that only 24% of voters thought the coalition was actually going to win. And the bookies had Labor on $1.30 and the Liberals on $4.65 the day before the election. They were miles off. I recall joking with some of my colleagues that I should put a big bet down on the Liberals as a hedging strategy for the Labor Party. For the record, I never carried through with that idea. <laughs> the expectation of an easy Labor victory existed despite the recent cliffhanger federal election. And the consequences of those expectations made Labor's campaign extremely difficult. It creates a peculiar by-election type effect. It's, and it is very different to the more even playing field of a general election. First, it increased people's potential to register protest vote against the government. Second, it meant people were not judging Ted Bayou or his policies critically as 
because they didn't think he would actually win. The Liberals understood this very well. They ran front page adverts saying, Brumby Labor expects to win easily. Send them the wake up call they deserve. This was exactly the same advertisement that the Liberals had run in the Altona by-election nine months earlier. It was a by-election approach taken to a general election. Our strategy for the campaign was to make the election about the future and about leadership. Strong leadership for the times ahead was our slogan. We wanted the contest to come down to a clear choice between John Brumby's strong leadership for the times ahead and Ted Bayou, who was unknown and in our view had no real plans and was not worth the risk. We knew that overall a strong 12% majority of people felt Victoria was heading in the right direction and that we live in a successful state. Our economy was strong, our health and education systems were better than other states. Tapping into this sentiment was the reasoning behind our secondary slogan of let's keep the jobs coming. However, while voters did acknowledge that uh, Victoria uh, was successful, this did not translate into them thinking that Labor deserved to be re-elected. In fact, they thought the opposite, with a significant majority of voters believing that it was time to give someone else a go. Labor's long period in office was weighing heavily against us. And we knew that if the election became a referendum on Labor's 11 years in office, that we were toast. So we attempted to focus voters' minds on the times ahead. We wanted them to think about the challenges of the future and which leader and party were best equipped to meet them. Our second focus was on John Brumby. We wanted to turn the election into a presidential style race between Mr Brumby and Mr Bayou. We knew voters respond, re respected John Brumby as a person who had led Victoria through some extraordinary times. The worst drought since Federation, the global financial crisis and of course the horrific Black Saturday bushfires. Even after the polls tightened, John Brumby enjoyed a huge lead over Ted Bayer as preferred Premier. This lead stretched out to 16% early in the campaign and he also had a significantly higher uh, approval rating. On these two metrics, Mr Brumby was clearly a lift on the Labor vote as he rated more highly than our primary, while Mr Bayou was a drag on the Liberal vote. In terms of the different approaches Labor could have taken to the campaign, the leadership frame was clearly our best. <clears throat> it was also a good way to focus people on the choice. They had to choose between who they wanted to lead Victoria for the future, not just cast a vote about the past. We also knew that despite being in Parliament for 11 years and Liberal leader for five years, Ted Bayou remained largely unknown to voters. With the Coalition having not been in government for 11 years, it was always going to be hard to credibly attack the record of school and hospital closures and services cuts of the previous government, of the previous Liberal government, I should say. I mean, the fact is, 11 years is a long time. I mean, it took five years to win the Second World War, it took three years to build the atom bomb. For many people, 11 years is two marriages. Um, it's a long time. And the Liberals were not going to give Labor an opening like they did in 2002 and 2006. Kim Wells gave a rare interview during the election campaign, he's the, the, now the Treasurer for those who don't know, where he promised no cuts, no fewer than four times. However, we did know that personally linking Mr Bayou to the cuts and sell-offs through his role as Liberal Party President and through his real estate company's involvement in asset sales was effective. Why? Well, it was effective because it was something that he was personally involved in as an individual. On the face of it, a leadership contest and a future focus seemed like strong cards for Labor to play. That is until, of course, you look at the cards that the Coalition had. The Coalition ran a simple and effective campaign. It was a referendum on 11 years of Labor government in Victoria. They had a lot of cards to play and they came up with an effective slogan trifecta. Firstly, the time for a change slogan. After 11 years, Labor's passed its use by date. The protest vote slogan. Brumby Labor expects to win easily. Make sure they get the wake up call they need. And then finally, the fix the, fix the problem slogan which actually was, fix the problems, build the future. There was no single issue that lost Labor the election. There was a common 
but there was a common theme that Daniel Andrews himself has acknowledged, that, and that was that the government did not keep pace with the strong growth that the state was experiencing. This manifested itself in many ways and was, melt, and was felt most strongly in the suburbs. Quite simply, services were not keeping up with the growth in the suburbs. And any honest assessment of this election result needs to acknowledge this. And most potent, in my view, was public transport and cost of living. But our polling indicated <coughs> that in isolation, none of these issues were driving large numbers of voters away from Labor. Instead, a time for a change sentiment or general dissatisfaction with the government was the reason given by a staggering 40% of people switching from Labor to the coalition. The key insight of the Liberals' campaign was to link the list of issues the government was facing with the desire by many people to cast a protest vote or the strong time for a change sentiment that existed in the electorate. As Tony Robinson said on election night, it's as if there's something in the DNA of Australians that says after 10 years in office, it's time to give the other mob a go. John Howard couldn't do it. He could never win an election after 10 years in office. Jeff Kennett never got there. As John Howard's key campaign strategist in 2006, Liberal State Director Tony Nutt understood the potency of this strategy. As an 11, in fact, as he told me after the election, to be truthful, as an 11 year old government, people stop listening to you. If you have a politically and electorally fatigued public, as we faced after the federal election, it becomes even harder again. It was against this strategic backdrop that the, we entered the 25 day campaign and the key events unfolded. By the end of the first week of the campaign, Labor's polling in a tracked bucket of battleground seats showed that the Labor vote had plunged from a 2PP of 55-45 in October to 48-52 against us. This showed that when people turned their mind to the election, there was a significant appetite for change and it showed uh, the challenge that Labor had in front of it. The scale of the campaign challenge for Labor became even clearer after the first major milestone for the campaign, the televised debate and the People's Forum. The debate was held on the first Friday of the campaign and both, performers, uh, both leaders performed reasonably well. But so low were the expectations about Ted Bayou <clears throat> and so high were the expectations about John Brumby that many commentators saw it as a win for Mr Bayou. The outcome of the People's Forum at the Burvale Hotel in Nutterwadding the following week was even more worrying for Labor. In front of an audience of 200 undecided voters from the eastern suburbs, the two leaders took turns answering questions and outlining their plans. Bayou again put in a solid performance, maybe a little bit uh, lengthy with some of the answers, but a solid performance. Brumby put in a very strong performance and faced a battery of questions that covered almost every aspect of government service delivery. Listening to the questions that night, you realise how tough the business of state government actually is. Coordinating 370,000 public sector employees to deliver about 47 billion worth of services that are vital every year and which people rightly expect to be delivered to a very, very high standard. It is a very, very hard ask. The commentators on the night gave the People's Forum to Brumby. As for the 200 undecided voters who were there that night, 37% said they were going to vote for Ted Bayou. The, all, all the Liberals. 31% said they were going to vote Labor and 32% were still undecided. In many ways, the result from the People's Forum says it all. With our opponent promising to fix the problems with a clear plan, the details which were still to, uh, to follow, Labor simply could not convince people that it deserved 15 years in office. Let me now turn to the Liberals' decision to preference the Greens last. This was probably their most significant tactical decision during the campaign. The Greens had been in negotiations with Labor and the Liberals about what they were going to do with their preferences. On Saturday the 13th of November, Labor reached an arrangement with the Greens that had the Greens preferencing to Labor ahead of the Liberals in 13 marginal seats. On the Sunday evening, following the Liberals' campaign launch earlier in the day, Tony Nutt announced the Liberals would preference the Greens last. 
The initial reaction of many commentators was one of shock and surprise. After all, senior liber Liberals like Peter Costello and Helen Kroger had been recommending the Liberals preference Labor last. Why would the Liberals give preferences to Labor and help them win the inner city seats? The answer quickly became clear. For the first time in the campaign, Ted Bayou had a message clarity that he had lacked up until this point. It made him look strong and, and decisive, despite persistent rumours that he and his closest advisers were the last to agree. He no longer spent the first half of every press conference explaining what his party position on preferences was. This gave him valuable oxygen to talk about the alleged shortcomings of the Brumby government. The business community stopped complaining and the commentators stopped writing stories and questioning what the Liberals actually stood for. In fact, uh, a lot of the interest in the Greens evaporated and the media focused on the main game, the Labor versus the Coalition contest. If, I've got to say, if the media had applied the same scrutiny to the Liberals' policies as they did to the potential Liberal-Green preference deal for much of the campaign, it may have been a very different campaign. But most importantly out of all of this, for Ted Bayou and the Liberals in my view, their decision on preferences with the Greens allowed Mr Bayou to steer the protest vote in the Liberals' direction. He could say to people, if you want to send the government a message, you've got to vote Liberal. The following Tuesday, on November the 16th, Labor held its launch in the old Capitol Theatre in Bendigo. The Bendigo launch was a real highlight for our campaign. Brumby, of course, who spent much of his life in Bendigo, received nothing short of a hero's welcome. The launch was used to launch Education for Life, the Year 9 experience. I won't bore you with the details of it. I'm sure you heard about it many times during the campaign. But this was a policy which Brumby had been pushing in one form or another for a number of years. And state elections can be hard for voters to follow. Each side promises hundreds of this, thousands of this, more nurses, teachers, police officers, schools, hospitals. It can all blur into one. The policy highlight for Labor was the Year 9 experience. It captured the public imagination more than any other commitment. It gave our campaign some critical momentum in the second last week of the campaign. Now I want to turn to the final week and in particular the last 48 hours. The final week saw our polling move dramatically. Ted Bailey started the week saying he would sue the Labor Party over our TV adverts, reminding people about his role in the sale of schools and a hospital. The following day, he was facing further new revelations about his real estate company. On the Wednesday night of the last week, our polling had Labor's vote at 52.48 Labor's way. This was a long, grinding clawback from where we had been in the first week of the campaign. The Coalition spent the last week of the campaign on a spending spree. Almost $1.6 billion was pledged for stamp duty cuts, power bill relief and ambulance fees. They also pop, uh, announced a range of uh, popular measures, uh, publishing location of speed cameras um, and so on. Uh, in contrast, Labor followed a traditional campaign approach. Outline your policy initiatives and details early and spend the last week of the campaign reminding people of your policies and your main message. What we calculated that the public would be cynical about big spending last minute promises and our compliance with the Treasury costing process meant all big spending promises were completed by Monday. On Wednesday night, our TV advertising stopped as did uh, those of our opponents. By Thursday night, uh, more than one point had come off the 2PP for Labor in 24 hours and we were on 51.49. We were deeply worried uh, because the undecided voters were coming in and they were falling the coalition's way. In my view, the last day of the campaign was the best for Mr Bayou. We had calculated that the last 48 hours would be dominated by the unravelling of the costings of the Liberals' election promises and this would, be, this would confirm that they could not be trusted to govern. We had spent a lot of the campaign pointing to the fact that the Liberals had not released any policy documents. Even for the Liberal Party, this was a new low. 
The conventional wisdom is that if you want to show people you are ready to govern, you put in the hard work and you actually produce policies with costings. That is what Victorian Labor did from opposition in 99, and that's what Federal Labor did from opposition in 2007. By contrast, the Liberals sent out media releases with numbers sprinkled through them like confetti, but no overall reconciliation, no costings table. We were right in predicting that the Liberals' costings would unravel. On the Thursday before the election, the Coalition released a three-page summary of their expenditure commitments. It contained basic errors and was nothing short of a joke. By the last week, it had also become clear that the Coalition's clear plan to fix the problems was more like a plan for plans, with the Liberals promising no fewer than 32 investigations or inquiries. Our mistake, however, was to think that these sorts of mistakes by the Liberals would cut through and dominate the final days of the campaign like they'd done in 2006 and like they'd done in 2002. The Costings era did get a run, but the news cycle had quickly moved on. The Liberals' last-minute spending and promises spree, together with an effective message, got over the top of us. Our post-election research confirms that there was a very, very late swing to the Coalition. We found that almost 30% of people uh, only decided how they would vote either a few days before the election or on election day. About 12.5% of people actually decided on the day. While the, while the result was heartbreaking for Labor, there were a number of strong results that deserve highlighting. Firstly, nothing went horribly wrong f with our campaign, which for anyone who's been involved in an election campaign is an achievement. There were no major hiccups, no major policy or costing errors. It was a well-run campaign. The six major Melbourne newspapers, the dailies and the two uh, Sundays, all editorialised for the return of a Brumby government as did most of the major regional papers. Stakeholder groups were also very supportive during the campaign. Unions, community groups, business groups all came out and supported Labor. So while we did get some things wrong as a government and uh, as part of our campaign, it also shows that we may, must have got some things right. In terms of lessons for Labor, I think that despite these highlights, there is no getting around the, res around the result. A win is a win and a loss is a loss. I think everyone in the senior ranks of Victorian Labor feels some personal responsibility for the loss. Uh, as I've said before, as State Secretary and Campaign Director, the weight of the loss rests heavily on my shoulders. Moving on, I think the early signs for Labor in opposition are promising. Uh, Labor has not slipped into the trap of ousted, of, for many ousted long-term governments, of thinking it is a government in exile. Daniel Andrews has a strong story to tell. He was born and educated in regional Victoria. He is a suburban dad of three that lives in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. He has extraordinary ability and drive, but he lives in an ordinary house, in an ordinary street, in an ordinary suburb. Daniel has the team very focused on being a good opposition and keeping the Liberal government accountable. The Liberals may have also made some extraordinarily big promises to fix the problems. You know, these include investigating scrapping my key, reducing power and water bills, slashing water rates, eliminating crime, the list goes on. And as Daniel Andrews has observed, it's a lot easier to talk about the problems than it is to actually fix them. Each promise, no matter how big or small, meant something to the community or organisation it was aimed at, and it is Labor's new job to hold them to account. Victorian Labor did an amazing job in renewing itself after the electoral defeat of 1992. It was in those years that Labor built the foundation for what would become the most successful Victorian government of the modern era. There is no reason why Labor cannot use its current stint in opposition to renew itself and come back stronger than ever. The Brax and Brumby Labor governments served longer than any other in this state and they left office after 11 years with their heads held high. Despite our faults, Labor achieved real outcomes that are making a real difference to people's lives. In concluding my address, I want to take the opportunity to thank former Premiers John Brumby and Steve Brax. 
I had the great opportunity to work with them both for an extended period of time, and I believe them to have been great leaders for our state. John Brumby had enormous energy, drive and ambition for Victoria. He was a policy innovator and a reformer. He was a state builder in the great tradition of Victorian premiers. Can I also thank the party supporters, the affiliated trade unions and the thousands of party members whose blood, sweat and tears helped Labor hold on to so many critical seats. And finally, can I thank the Victorians who stuck with us and voted Labor. At the end of the day, uh, we felt uh, one seat short um, and at the end of the day, we currently hold one seat more than we did when we formed office in 1999. Labor has provided Victoria with strong government for the last 11 years and we have lost by the smallest of margins. We remain strong and motivated, capable of learning from our mistakes and planning for a new era of reform. Thank you very much. Lots of time for questions, and I'm sure there'll be lots of them. Microphones are at the back of the room, and we'll come to you. So, who's going to kick us off? Sorry, I yeah, thought I. Sorry, you. Uh... Uh, Ken, I'll come to you in just one moment. Uh, you said that uh, one of the focuses was uh, a presidential style campaign on John Brumby versus Ted Bowie. Do you think that was a mistake or do you think there was too much of a focus on that? Uh, no, I don't think it was a mistake. Um, you know, we had a range of options available to us going into the campaign and all the evidence available to us which was extensive, indicated that that was the best frame for Labor to run the contest. Uh, Nick, uh, Ken Davis from the, uh, from the Clifton Group. Uh, firstly, thank you for coming uh, today. A lot of people wouldn't have the courage, I don't think, to, uh, to prop up and face the uh, face to fast bowling. Um, I travel on the Glen Waverley line and it's been an absolute disaster for a long time and uh, you know, we get down to 10 kilometres coming out of Hayington and because of infrastructure. And, uh, did you not, did your research not show that you no, know, there was anger at Flinders Street or is, the, is it really that the situation is insoluble, that we're going to live with uh, whoever's <coughs> in charge, the uh, transport's going to be a crock... Uh, no, who's ever in charge, whether it be the Liberals, Labor or the Jesuits, you know. Um, well, look, clearly the problem's not insoluble because the new Premier has promised that he's going to fix the problems. Um, in terms of um, the experience that people were having on the public transport system, uh, of course Labor was aware of that. You couldn't not be, you know. Uh, people in the government use public transport that Brumby regularly made a point of getting out on public transport. Um, our party research was telling us that there was a problem out there. Any person who was connected to the community knew that there was a problem with public transport. A and we knew that there was other problems as well. You know, the, the government wasn't deaf to the, or blind to these things. I guess the point I was, tr and you know, uh, and I touched on some of those other uh, stresses and strains and grievances uh, in, in my speech. What, what the Liberal campaign did well, though, was to take those individual grievances and put them together with a time for a change sentiment, which existed strongly given we had an 11-year-old government. We knew that uh, those individual issues uh, were, um, uh, were driving dissatisfaction for the government, but none of them on their own was enough to drive huge numbers of people away from Labor. It was the bringing together of the individual grievances with the time for a change sentiment, which was what became so potent in the, uh, the Liberals' campaign. Um, hi, just want to interrupt from the Australian. Um, do you think that, given the federal election result um, and the state election result, Labor <coughs> is having a bit of an identity crisis? I mean, you lost the left to Adam Bant in Melbourne and then you shifted you, you spent a lot of money trying to fight the inner city and then some claim you have lost your heartland in the suburbs. How, what's next for Labor's identity? How do you figure out where you stand? 
Uh, well, look, this always gets said um, after uh, elections, and even uh, when elections aren't on, people in the Labor Party in particular love uh, hand-wringing and talking about you know, what the party stands for and what its future is. Uh, it's almost a quality of the Labor Party that vastly more gets written about it as an organisation and uh, vastly more thinking goes on about what it stands for than any of the other political parties by a country mile. And that's because, you know, Labor has the harder job in politics. You know, we are the party of progress. We are the party of innovation. The opposition are the party of conservatism and the party of stopping progress. So we've always got the harder argument to make. Uh, and there are times when that task is a difficult one. And so, yes, from time to time, there are reflections on what we stand for. Um, does it uh, detract in any way from what uh, most Labor Party people think is the historical mission of the party? No, I don't think it does. Paul Austin from The Age. Mr Rees. Um, you say that Labor is capable of learning from its mistakes. I listened to your speech quite carefully and I couldn't identify many mistakes. Are you able to tell us whether the Brax Brumby 11-year-old government made any mistakes? and whether the Labor campaign team in the last four weeks and over the past year made any mistakes? Uh, most certainly, Paul. And look, I, I, to be fair, I did think I touched on some of those in the course of the speech. Um, I, I don't want to bore the audience with a long catalogue of, I think, you know, every grievance that voters had with Labor, but certainly, you know, we've touched on public transport today. I think my key was obviously an issue for the government. Um, I think cost of living issues, particularly when the um, opposition managed to link them to government decisions like on smart meters or desal uh, or waste with my key was, was potent. Um, in terms of campaign mistakes, um, yeah, there were definitely some. Um, I will save, I think, uh, most of my commentary about them for the internal review that, that Labor's doing at the moment. But I will be up front, there were, there were mistakes that were made. There were things that I would do differently if given the opportunity again. Um, Mal Five here from the Sunday Age, Nick. Um, I was just wondering, in the lead up to the election, my feeling was that Labor dismissed uh, Ted Bailey, that he, you know, obviously the rhetoric was that he was weak and lazy, but also behind the scenes it seemed to me that, that Labor never really thought he was he was going to make it, that he would, he would stumble in some way. I'm wondering if you underestimated um, Ted Bailey, but also underestimated the people around him. I mean, obviously Tony Nutt and other people who um, were behind the, the, the Liberal Party strategy. Uh, well, look, I'd start with Tony Nutt. Uh, I would certainly never underestimate him. I mean, he was John Howard's chief of staff. He was the chief architect of uh, a number of his elections. Uh, uh, including the 1996 election, which, of course, John Howard lost. Uh, he's one of the most uh, experienced operators uh, in Australian politics, uh, and he's no slouch. So, uh, certainly, on our side, uh, we never underestimated him. Uh, as for Ted Bailey, um, we certainly never thought that he was unelectable. Absolutely not. We thought that he was electable. Um, but what we did know that was, in a comparison with John Brumby, people did not see him as strong and uh, they did not view him as favourably. There's, there's a distinct difference between seeing uh, the, the two leaders and our leader having a strong lead to seeing your opponent as being unelectable. We, we, we never viewed Ted Bayou in that way. Hey, Nick. Matt Dunkley from the AFR. Um, I'm curious to know whether you think that that that's view that Labor was going to be returned also affected your supporters? Uh, no, I mean, I think the uh, 2010 state election was uh, a great experience for the Labor Party in terms of um, our volunteers and for uh, our, the support we get from affiliated trade unions. Um, I, I could not have really asked for more support. Um, you know, in some of the more high-profile uh, campaigns, uh, like Northcote, like Brunswick,
Brunswick, like Richmond, you know, you had hundreds and hundreds of Labor volunteers out there hitting the pavement, doing the hard campaign work. And there was an energy about those campaigns which I haven't seen for a long time. You know, it was, um, it was reminiscent of Kevin 07, um, and given that we were an 11-year-old government going for a fourth term, it was extraordinary that we were able to achieve that. So, um, to, to go directly to your question, Matt, um, I, I, think, uh, I think that we got good support from uh, the union movement, and I think in particular we got great support from our volunteer base. Yes. Nick, uh, Hugo Kelly, as a card-carrying member of the party, I've listened to you talk about some of the issues today. You've so far blamed both apathy, um, the years. You said you blame the media for not attacking the Liberal Party hard enough for their cost blowouts. You can see that the Liberals ran a good campaign. You sort of mentioned a couple of vague issues where you may have made mistakes, but you're not going to publicly admit anything else. For me, the apotheosis of a, a government that lacked vision was rerunning those four-year-old ads, and I got this on election day handing out how to vote cards, blaming Ted Bowden um, for something he'd done many years ago. It seemed to me the problem at the core of the campaign was a lack of vision. And you can see that 11 years is a long time, but a lack of vision is also a cancer at the heart of government. Uh, well, I think you go for an 11-year-old government that uh, Brumby Labor did very well to portray a, a, a forward vision for Victoria. You know, we're out there talking about the real challenges that Victoria faces, you know, like the, the fact that 200 babies are born every day, the fact that each week there's 1,000 people turning 65. These present huge challenges for our health system and for our education system. Uh, every week, uh, sorry, every day, 100 new homes are built uh, and completed in Victoria. Servicing those new homes, those new suburbs, those new estates is a huge challenge. And we went out with a pretty comprehensive program to tackle those things. Um, as for the, uh, the ad that you referred to, uh, we, we ran that because it was true, because it was based on facts, and because uh, just like 2006, it wasn't. Uh, Joseph. Nick, Joseph McCartney, ABC News. Just wondering what you uh, now foresee for yourself. Um, do you plan to stay active inside the parliament <coughs> and is your future in the parliament? Uh, well, my uh, immediate priority is to uh, have a holiday. Uh, I think I've actually worked uh, every day of 2010, so uh, I need a rest. Uh, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, uh, spending some quality time with my wife and family and friends and loved ones over the Christmas period. Uh, after that, I'll come back with a clear mind and decide uh, what I do next. But so it's my intention to stay, you know, involved in the Labor Party and active in the Labor movement. I'm very passionate about it. Um, Is it not a logical conclusion from your speech that the loss in November was inevitable, given what you've suggested? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a million dollar question, David. And look, I, I do think I have spoken about a number of failures of the campaign today. Uh, you know, the fact that we didn't have a message which was more compelling than our opponents. Uh, the fact that uh, we lost the last week and critically lost the last 48 hours. I think I have acknowledged uh, some uh, shortcomings there. Um, do I think a loss was uh, an inevitable uh, outcome? Uh, uh, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I'll go to my grave wondering. Nick, I'm just Heidi Murphy from 3AW. Do you think Labor honestly can win in 2014? Uh, I know we'll give it a red hot go. I mean, I think, as I said, the early signs are good for Labor. Uh, I think Daniel Andrews has made a good start. Uh, I think he's kind of got a team around him which are, are focused and uh, so far it's been very disciplined. You know, um, ill discipline is a killer for oppositions. Uh, you know, the sort of the background in the, the leader.
leaking, the backstabbing. So far, the signs have been really good for Labor, and you know they're, they're focused. Um, and as I said, there's, there's no one going around saying, "Oh, we should have won," and and and, and pretending in some way that we're still in government. Like reality has hit, and it's been accepted. And now people are very focused on doing the very best they can to be the best opposition Labor can be. So just one more question. Um, <coughs> some people have suggested, you mentioned there's a disconnect between what the polls are telling you and what people in the suburbs are saying. There's been a lot of commentary about political parties over reliance on polls and research groups and how that informs decision making. Do you think that this, your experience with this election means that maybe you should look at alternatives to just polling and research groups? Uh, Certainly, I wouldn't want to leave people today with a mistaken view that in some, in some way what drives the Labor Party is polling and research. It, it doesn't. It's just one input. You know, uh, the, the Labor governments in Victoria over their period in office would have done uh, hundreds, I would say, of community cabinets. And uh, Steve Brax and John Brumby were out in the community consulting on a daily basis. Like, you know, the, they, they saw listening and getting out there as a core thing that they are required to do. So, um, yes, polling and research has its place. It's one input, but it is certainly not the, the dominant input. It's not the driving input, and it certainly doesn't supersede the core beliefs or vision of the Labor Party and what it stands for. Lovely. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick's term as uh, State Secretary expires at the end of January. He was always going to finish at that time, win, lose or draw. Of course, his employment prospects are always going to be much brighter with a win. I'm reliably told that when the election result became clear, Nick said, I need a drink. I need a job. <laughs> Let me say, Nick, and I kid you not, I know how you feel. <laughs> but it's in that spirit that we are pleased to present you with a jolly decent bottle of bonk and a book about how to find a job. <laughs> and it's titled, What Colour Is Your Parachute? A Practical Manual for Job Hunters and Career Changers. Thank you for joining us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our function. Have a very Merry Christmas and we'll see you next year.